name is Kazu, I use he, him pronouns. I'm also part of the core team at East Point. And uh, I imagine that was not nearly enough time to do, I don't think we should even call it check-ins, um, which is ironic because one of the things that I wanted to start today by talking about is um, how in our society we have like, how are you? is a really common thing that we're constantly asking each other. And I feel like probably 99% of the time that those three words are used next to each other, we don't actually mean it, right? Like oftentimes when we say, how are you? We're expecting a canned response of I'm doing fine, let's move on to the next thing. And how rarely we have an opportunity to really ask ourselves, like, how are we really doing? How are you really doing in this moment? And I think that's a really important question because the response to that question is oftentimes almost always incredibly complex, right? And we oftentimes don't even slow down enough for ourselves to realize how complex the response to that is. Hopefully part of our response is that we actually are joyful and in love and in connection and in community and hopeful and vibrant and all of these things. Um, but chances are, it's also other things that are more difficult. Um, all of us have lived through three years of a global pandemic that none of us could have really seen coming. We are living with constant um, examples of the climate crisis. Um, you know, I have family in Florida that I was just talking to earlier today, and my mom has a chipped tooth and she can't go to the dentist because all the dentists are closed because of this hurricane that's, that's hitting um, Florida. Um, ongoing war, you know, I now have extended family in, in, in Taiwan that are constantly at threat of uh, what, what might happen there with China. We all just lived through four years of the Trump presidency. Um, this nation is going through a racial reckoning and racial uprisings and social media is bombarding us with images of violence and increases in hate crimes. And we're living with all of these things. So the response to how are you can't just be we're doing good. And it's actually normal for us to not be doing good, right? One of the things that I really want to do is to normalize trauma and to normalize the idea that if you're traumatized, if you're experiencing symptoms of PTSD, it does not make you weak or broken. It makes you human, right? That trauma is a natural response to unnatural things occurring in our lives. It's a tricky thing, though, because telling somebody who has symptoms of PTSD that everything is traumatizing and that the next trigger for your trauma is around every corner is actually amongst the worst things that you can do. And I feel like we have this culture where we're telling people white supremacy is everywhere and the climate crisis is coming to get us and all of these things. And it actually doesn't allow our nervous system enough time to settle so that we can integrate the real things that we are experiencing. And so, you know, how do we reckon with the reality that we are in a crisis, we are in a climate crisis, we are experiencing intergenerational trauma without spiraling and without it becoming a re-traumatized thing, a re-traumatizing thing just to acknowledge how we're doing. And so I think one of the most important things that we can do is to learn to take care of ourselves and to know that we always have tools to, to notice, oh, I'm actually not doing well. And there are things that I can do to help care for myself. I have been thinking a lot about um, the reality that self-care is delusional. Like in an interdependent world, there is no thing as self-care. Um, and at the same time, there's this dual truth that we actually do need to care for our own selves and our own bodies. And so I just want to share a couple of slides before we do a small group activity. Um, should be able to see this. Uh, you know, when I ask people, like, what do you do when you're experiencing a really difficult day? I had a challenging day and you get lots of different responses like this. And I used to have this conversation a lot with many, many different groups of people, incarcerated people, young people. And so we get lots of different responses. And every once in a while, I would get certain responses from people 
that I didn't necessarily expect. Um, but these are legitimate responses, right? Like people do go to some of these things when we're feeling stressed out. And I felt like there was something different about some of these responses than what I was hoping to get from the audience when I asked them that question. And I realized at some point that there's a difference between coping and resilience. Coping is about, or the dictionary definition at least, is to struggle or deal, especially on fairly even terms with some degree of success, whereas resilience is the ability to recover from something. Um, coping just helps you maintain and it helps you, it prevents you from falling deeper down a ditch of despair. Whereas resilience helps you come back to kind of quote unquote normal. But I started to think about too, that even like the, you know, as we're coming, like we're transitioning in this like COVID phase that we're in, and as all these conversations about like coming back to normal, I realized that like coming back to normal is actually not enough for most people. Right. And what we really need to be thinking about is how do we thrive, which is about growing and, and becoming stronger and becoming more resilient. If coming back to normal means going back to where the world was three years ago and pretending that that's sustainable for any of us, that's not going to like that's not OK. Right. And so we need to be thriving. And so in reality, I think there's a spectrum of things that we do to take care of ourselves that goes from coping strategies on one end and thriving strategies on the other. And um, there's not one tool that looks the same for all people. One tool that might be a thriving practice for one person might actually be a coping strategy for another. And so I wanna do a small group activity where we begin to discern all of this for ourselves, but just a couple of considerations as we move into this. One is that coping is not bad. Like there is a spectrum and it's important to be mindful of the tools that we are utilizing in our lives. But we also live in this society where we place a lot of judgment on coping strategies. And sometimes coping is all we have the energy to do to, to maintain and, and, and keep moving through the day. And I think there's a lot of benefit to just saying, you know what, I just, I just need to do this one thing that I know is not ultimately healthy for myself, but I just need to do it just to get through the day. And it's not a bad thing, right? To remember what works for you, because like I have a meditation practice that works well for me. I know a lot of other people who has tried meditating and it's just not a thing that has resonated with them. So finding something that works for you. One thing that has been helpful for me in discerning what might be a strategy that is closer to the, the, the side of coping versus thriving is that oftentimes I'll binge watch a show on Netflix. And at the end of the night, I feel a little bad about myself. I'm kind of like, it, it was helpful, like it was fun, but at the end of the night, I was like, man, it's probably a, a better way that I could have spent my time. Whereas I have never meditated. I have never gone out for a hike in the woods. I have never gone to the gym and exercise. And at the end of it felt like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Like it was probably a better use of my time, right? So that might be a helpful thing in discerning what is a coping strategy and what is a thriving strategy. Um, intention matters. I used to have a dog and three, four times a day, I would take this dog out for a walk. And most of the time it was just a chore, right? It's something that I had to do as an obligation, but every once in a while I was going through my day and I felt tired. So I made an intention that I'm gonna take my dog out for a walk. I'm gonna breathe some fresh air. I'm gonna feel the sun on my skin and enjoy going around the neighborhood for a little bit. The activity was the exact same thing. I took my dog out for the same exact amount of time, the same exact route, but because I put intention into the practice, 
it changed my relationship with the practice, right? So as we're thinking about how we're using these strategies, sometimes the same strategy might be a coping strategy, but when you put in intention behind it, it can become a thriving practice. And finally, we'll talk a little bit more about this in our large group debrief too, but equity matters. Sometimes, oftentimes, maybe all the time, the choices for the tools that we use, the access that people have to those tools depends largely on things like social economic factors, right? Not everyone has access to the same choices that we do, which is another reason why we have to stop placing judgment on coping strategies. Because sometimes that's all people have access to are coping strategies that don't necessarily make someone stronger, but it's what helps people survive day to day, right? And so as we think about the choices that we make and the tools that we have access to, we also want to keep this in, in the background, that we live in an unjust and unequitable society. So the choices that we have or don't have are not always ours to make alone, right? And so these are just some considerations that I want us to hold as we go into small groups and we'll debrief more as a large group as well. Um, but what I'd like you to do is in a second, not quite yet, but you will get this uh, link in, to your, in the chat box. Um, it's eastpointpeace.org backslash spectrum. And when you click on that link, You'll be taken to a Google uh, doc that just says group one, group two, group three, so on and so forth. And when you get into your small groups, I want you to look at what small group you're in. It should say on the top of your screen, you're in group one, group two, group three. Click on the link that is the right link for your group, right? So if you're in group two, click on the, the link that says group two. And each group will be taken to a Google slide that looks like this. It'll have the spectrum from coping to, to thriving on the bottom and a bunch of empty post-its. Um, and you can type different things into the post-its and move it around. And so the instruction for the activity is what I want you to do is I'll put it into the chat now. These are the instructions. Once you're in your small group, just very briefly introduce yourself and share when your birthday is. And then whosever birthday is coming up next, that person will go first by sharing one tool that they use when they're experiencing stress, noticing trauma coming up, experiencing what in nonviolence we sometimes call internal violence of the spirit. Share one tool that you use and say a few words about your relationship to that tool. And then type that tool into one of the post-its and then move that post-it around on the spectrum based on where you think that tool falls on the spectrum for you. Again, it might be different for different people, right? And then you'll move on to the next person. And you'll have about 20 minutes in your small groups just to have that conversation and move different um, tools around on the spectrum. So that is the activity. Um, again, we'll debrief as a large group when we come back, but are there any questions about what you're about to do? Awesome. Um, and just so you know, the folks who noted that they don't want to be in small groups, we're actually, ironically, we're gonna put you in a small group of the people who don't wanna be in small groups, just so the facilitators can have some time to debrief in the large group, but please feel free to keep your screen off and and your, uh, your mic muted and just hang out and, and, and chill in that small group. Um, so if there's no more questions, um, Kate will put you into those small groups. You'll come back in 20 minutes and then we'll debrief as a large group. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I wanted to give you a good chunk of time in your small group. So hopefully that was enough time to get into some good discussion. And we're actually going to do um, a, diff a slightly different spin on that spectrum together as a large group. But before I do that, I just wanted to open it up and see if anyone had any thoughts, comments, reflections, um, anything that they wanna offer from their small groups or just what's on your mind now. Pat, you're getting some love in the chat, so just so you know. From Luis and other people too, I'm sure. 
Yeah, any, anyone off, wanna offer any reflections? Some gratitude yeah. for small groups, yeah. Um, I love the distinction between coping and thriving. Like, I, I love that. It's, it's, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any other shares or reflections? Just want to set up. Uh, I think something that stood out to me as I was processing with my group was that even though something might look like a healthy like thriving mechanism on the outside it could still be a coping mechanism for me on the inside yeah absolutely we've all gotten really good at disguising things so things look great on the outside and you know even something as as healthy as like like going for a run i've talked to a lot of people who like have almost gotten addicted to like exercise in a way that's actually not healthy. So real discernment is necessary. Any other thoughts? Yes, I see a couple of hands, Luis and then Marlena. Yeah, I'll just mention somebody in our group brought this up and I was like, oh, that, that, that felt too true. Like the, the feeling a little bit triggered with the word resilience. Uh, particularly as a person of color and some other folks are like expected to be more resilient than maybe other groups are uh, in uh, you know that we, we talked about a little bit with my group and it, I just wanted to name it <laughs> just said I'm like I don't want to be resilient right now there's other people that are not allowed to be resilient and they can still like survive and, and thrive and so just naming that and that's just frustration I wanted to name it and let go yeah, thank you so much for that. So yeah, a lot of the complexities around different identities and positionalities and how we relate to all of this based on that. Thank you. Marlena. Oh, you're muted, Marlena. When I started out, I named the things that were the really thriving things because that's what I'm trying to focus on. But then I also named that for me, the things that have been coping things, which I think, you know, as somebody who comes from trauma, kept me from killing myself when I was younger, um, before I'd done a lot of healing, are, are not, not things that I can do. I can't do a little of them. If I start to do, if I start to do some of them, I do far, far, far too much. It just throws me into addictive tendencies. And I just wanted, wanted to name that, that some people can do a little of those coping things and they're fine and they can have fun with it. But some of us, it's, it's, it's not something that we can do and, and remain healthy at all, that we really have to really stick with those ones that are thriving because the others, you know, I've spent hours doing behaviors that I, that I'm sad that I wasn't doing like political activism, doing, doing behaviors and, and ways that have hurt my health and things. And so I just wanted to name that, that, that coping skills often slide right into addictions. Yeah, thank you so much for naming that. And definitely something I can resonate with too. Like I've been lucky enough to find some coping strategies that I have more choice over and, and agency over, namely Netflix and like reality TV shows. <laughs> Um, and there's other coping strategies that I know if I go to those, it's a really quick and dangerous slope. So absolutely. So what I want to invite you to now is I'm going to enter another link in the chat. And if you're having any tech challenges, uh, feel free to just follow us on the large screen because I'll share my screen as well. Um, but what you see is, hold on, let me share my screen. What you see is a similar spectrum, but there is now a vertical axis, axis. And the vertical axis is around access. Um, as we were talking about, not everyone has access to the same tools, right? And so as we think about this, we want to start to also bring a little bit more awareness around how much access do, do people throughout society have for some of the tools that we use around coping and thriving. And so what I want to invite people to do is to either raise your hand or I think a small enough group that maybe you can just come off of mute and share with us one tool that you have 
And like in your small groups, just share a couple of words about your relationship to that tool um, and then type it into the uh, post-it and move it both on the coping resilience thriving spectrum where you think it, it falls, but also on the vertical spectrum of less access, more access. Do people, do, does everyone throughout society have access to that tool or not and why? Um, just to bring a little bit more nuance into that. Um, does that make sense? And if so, yeah, want to encourage a couple of folks to share their story and their tool and you know, try it out. And again, if you're having tech challenges, I can help type things and move things around as well. Uh, yes, Nan, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, I, I think, uh, so I think uh, uh, for me, a uh, 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 a thriving uh, mechanism is to take a breath and to go back to my breath. But I, I have an I, a, a very privileged white person, um, have suffered with depression for a while, but um, for pretty much all my life. But I'm feeling uh, pretty good right now. But I also, and anybody can breathe. But I don't know, like, I think that I had, because of my, my privilege, had more access to the, like, if I, if I was living on the street, and somebody said, well, you can breathe, like, it's true, you can breathe, but, so I don't really, like, how, where would I put that, like, I don't want to say, okay, because you're underprivileged you can't do this you could do this but so much more is you know you have so much more against you yeah a lot of nuance in that um i think i would invite you to put it on wherever you feel like it might fall on the access i think it is true that um you know i've heard a lot of people talk about how like i, I i've worked with people who have so much um trauma that they just have not had an opportunity to to, to, to integrate that even slowing down enough and taking a deep breath brings up so much. And there's so much going on in their lives that they don't have the time to do that, right? So on the one hand, we think, yeah, everyone can take a breath and it's not that easy. So yeah, where would you put it? Thanks, that's helpful. Do you wanna, do you wanna put it somewhere or would you like me to move it for you? Uh, you're muted again. So I'm your, I'm on your share screen. So do I want to go put it somewhere? Can I? Can oh, I? Uh, if if you want to move it around, you'd have to to get out of the share screen and, and click on the, the the link yourself. But I can move it for you if you like. Oh, move it and move it. Pretty much, I would say to the level of the S in less access, but but as over as thriving as you can get. Yeah, it's very All thriving. Right. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Thank you. Yeah, Mary, great comment in the chat about um, asthma, air quality issues. Yeah, thank you for that. Anyone else want to give this a shot? We got time for several more. And also feel free to, um, if you don't want to say anything, feel free to just start writing things and moving, moving things around too. But time for a couple more voices. Uh, yes, Marlena, go ahead. I know I just shared, and I don't want to share too much, but I want to say this, which is that sometimes getting access has huge costs. And 30 years ago, as someone who's mixed race in Buddhist communities that were primarily white and wanting that access to be there for people of color, I started anti-racism work and day longs for people of color, but I got, you had all these amazingly aware people who had this blind spot and a lot of reactivity around it. And I got so much shit thrown at me that then I pulled away from Buddhism for years. And, and it was very, you know, it was like adding trauma on top of the trauma that I was already dealing with, with meditation. So I just want to say that that there are often costs for for creating more access um you know um 
to these things like like I, I you know I I'm, I'm so glad now the people who followed me you know a couple of couple of you know like I was in the first and second wave and the third wave people were the ones that started the East Bay Meditation Center and you know we kind of knocked some of the stuff out of the way before I got totally blown out and um you know and and um, but I just want to I somehow want to acknowledge that there are all these costs to that. And I don't know how to put that in this chart, but I wanted to say that. Thank you. And I also feel an obligation to thank you for that work, because as someone who you know, I've told the story in many places, too, like I used to have this like judgment that meditation is something that white people did and not something that I had access to, despite the fact that my people have been meditating for thousands of years. And it's through going to a lot of POC sanghas and stuff like that, that I felt like I've been able to gain a relationship to that practice. So I thank you for that work that allowed it, um, you know, that made it possible for me. Um, Johanna and Izzy, and then I see some stuff in the chat as well. Uh, that was very sweet, by the way. Um, anyway, uh, one thing, you know, I think about a lot, I, I work in the service industry, and uh, so the, the strategy is like drinking with coworkers, mm -hmm. um, which is like, you know, if you've ever worked in the service industry, that is like pretty much dominating in any kind of atmosphere you get to be in. Cause like you can have your shift beer after you, you know, clock out and with your coworkers and which you can commiserate and talk about, you know, your struggles and which I think is like, like one of the only has could be like in the past and only place where you kind of like build community. So I could see it being like crossing over into resilience. And I think, I think about it a lot right now as like something like, yeah, there's like access, you know, there and stuff. But at this point, it's really interesting to think about cause like, you know, in the service industry, you have like your front of house people that are back out there and you're like, you have camaraderie there, but a lot of working class kind of people, you know, working class jobs right now have become so individualized that even that is not like a source of kind of like community building anymore. Like I think about my like grandpa working in a factory, there's like 2000 people like on the floor that you can like talk with stuff. Whereas like factories now are like, you know, um, it's like there's one person that you kind of see regularly and you're getting all of your instructions from like an iPad attached to your hand, which is just so dehumanizing. So um, I'd say like just access of that is like going, that community building is going down. So I'd say like maybe like between coping and resilience in like the bottom third of this graph. Hey. Oh, I'm there. Sorry, that's, that's great, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, it's it's interesting to watch how as society changes and as work conditions shift, where we might place these tools might shift as well. Um, I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Is it Anson? Yes. Um, yeah, so one thing that came up with my group, um, just kind of thinking about how we now have so much available to us through the web. It's, you know, just this huge, you know, well, as we call it, the web is blanket that's usurping so much of, you know, like the world in general, it's all finding its way into the web somewhere. And um, a lot of, you know, there's a, this, you know, I mean, there's so much possibility there with uh, things for, self-care but at the same time just the sheer multitude of it all taking some level of as you said discernment or i think the word that we ended up using for it was just conscientiousness um with you know trying to be able to sift through it and you know not really buy into like the general you know dominant um you know paradigm that you know this capitalistic culture has a more it's just like oh if i just do more if i do all of these things then surely i'll be great and thriving but it seems that really we need to be finding like what can we cut out like what is um really you know getting in the way and you know where, how can we like what what can we get the most out of um 
but yeah, I don't know. As that as a, a post-it note, I'm not really sure how to really or where to place that. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, conscientiousness and discernment would be the buzzwords. Um, and then sp specifically, I guess, within the, the digital world specifically. Um, but even then, that's still just, you know, those are just signifiers for whatever rabbit hole it is that you choose to jump down. Thank you. Um, I'm not even going to try to spell conscientiousness. I can say it, but yeah, I mean, obviously, these, not every comment needs to go cleanly on a post-it and, and on the spectrum. So thank you for all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just want to share as we're kind of moving towards wrapping up that constantly throughout the day, every day, we are utilizing dozens probably of these tools. And oftentimes it's just that we're not mindful of it, right? And so in a world as crazy as the one that we live in, in the, the specific time period that we are living in, I think it's really important that we begin to bring a little bit more mindfulness and discernment. Um, oftentimes I do find myself binge watching Netflix and every once in a while, instead of allowing it to just happen, I give myself permission and say, you know what? It's been a really hard day. I'm gonna give myself permission to watch a couple of episodes. And just that intention actually moves it a little bit further up the spectrum so that it becomes less of a thing that's happening to me. And again, it's the same exact thing that I'm doing, but by giving myself permission to say, you know what? It's been a hard day, I deserve this. It changes it a little bit. And even like thriving practices, I find that like, because meditation is something I try to do on a regular basis, sometimes I stop putting intention behind it and it becomes less about thriving and more about just resilience. I noticed after some time of working with my therapist who I love and still love and will always appreciate. Um, and initially when I started working with this person, it was absolutely thriving. It was a lot of growth. It wasn't always easy, but it was a lot of growth. But after a while, I noticed, oh, I think we're just like resilient now. Maybe I need to look for a different therapist or a different modality. So by constantly bringing awareness and mindfulness into the tools that we're already doing, we can slowly start moving towards thriving, right? Without placing judgment on the coping strategies that we have. Um, and an important thing, because uh, as I shared, I think, the idea of individual liberation is, is a huge delusion that we've been sold by like the wellness industry. And that there is no such thing as individual delusion, uh, individual liberation, that there's only collective liberation. And in order for us to support collective liberation, we as individuals ironically need to be right so that we can hold space for other people to be well, right? If I'm not well, I'm not holding space for other people. So it's all these like multiple truths of like, individual liberation is a delusion there's only collective liberation and in order for collective liberation to happen we not only do we need to be well but we deserve to be well right so holding the multiplicity of all of that um so really grateful for just this very short amount of practice um this is only our second session of the beloved community well and i've always dreamt about like yeah nonviolence is a martial art how do we constantly practice every aspect of this together. So really appreciating everyone who's here. Um, and wanting to share one last quick thing as we end our night here is, um, oh, what happened? Can you all still see this? Oh, I see some nods and some shaking heads. Let me start over. Um, as you all know, um, East Point operates on a set of principles called the gift economy. Um, which means so many different things. Um, as we've come to understand it, we uh, practice the gift economy as guided by these eight principles. Um, and um, let's see, which one do I wanna, we, all, we said that every time we'd all spend just like 30 seconds talking about one of them. Um, let me just share a, a story that I oftentimes share around generosity because I've been in conversation with a lot of my friends who are incarcerated and or formerly incarcerated over the last couple of days. But a lot of you have heard the story once of when I went to um, Soledad prison um, in Soledad in Central California once, 
there's a, a team of nonviolence trainers that we work with in, in that prison. And when I walked into that prison one day, a couple of years ago, one of the, the men, incarcerated men, handed me a check for uh, almost $2,000. And this was, you know, it was a group of men that make as much as $2 a day for their labor. And they spent months going cell to cell, collecting resources to give to us and almost $2,000. And when he handed me that check, the guy said to me, you know, I, I, I want to, we want, we want to give you this money because we want to make sure people on the outside have access to your teachings in the same way that you brought them inside this prison. And I always think about that as this radical act of generosity. Like they raise money thinking about you all, making sure that we can offer this as a gift so that you all can be here without being charged a fee. And that's radical generosity, right? Is, is being generous and kind, thinking about people who you will never meet. Like their generosity, they're never gonna be able to see the actual human impact of that. And yet, they did it because they wanted to be generous. And so, so much of the gift economy is about trying to cultivate that culture of generosity. Um, and part of the principles is also transparency. So here's some numbers just for you all to know. Um, people can go to our website at any time and click two buttons and always see our budget, which we update every quarter. So you can see every penny we raise and every penny we spend. Um, and we have a goal of raising an average of about $4,000 per cycle through the beloved community well. So that equates to about $285 per session. Um, some sessions will raise more, some sessions will raise less. Um, as of today, we have raised $392. And as, as I said, this is our second session. So thank you to everyone who's already given. Um, I love this quote from Marshall Rosenberg, who says, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. Who's getting more joy out of this interaction, the boy or the duck? And that's what we want every person to think about every time you consider giving to support the East Point Peace Academy and the Necessary Trouble Collective, is would it give you joy to support our work? And if it would give you joy, then we invite you to go to this link, which Kate will put into the chat box as well. Please make sure to use this link so we can track it for this program. Um, and we invite you into this cycle of generosity and reciprocity. Nothing is required, um, but again, if it would give you joy knowing that it would support future sessions like this uh, and being able to be offered as a gift, we would welcome that. So again, thank you all. Uh, we'll be back again next week, same time, same channel, and I'll hand the mic over to Chris for a couple of closing announcements as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Kazu, and thank you, everyone, again, for being with us tonight. I invite folks to offer appreciations to Kazu in the chat. Uh, now would be a good time to shower him with appreciations for his sharing tonight. Um, I also want to bring to your attention uh, up some upcoming events uh, on the East Point calendar, just to name a few things coming up that you might be interested in. A week from today, we'll have the first relational uh, session of Beloved Community Well. And I'm gonna be part of the, the team that's gonna bring that along with Luis, who's in the room with us tonight and our teammate, Laura, as well. So inviting you to that. Starting next week, also, uh, our uh, friends and collaborators with the organization White Awake are beginning a series for white identifying folks called Roots Deeper Than Whiteness. Encourage you to look at our website to learn more about that. And then uh, the next uh, session uh, in the workshop style for Beloved Community Well will be the following week, October 12th. It happens to be my, be my birthday and that'll be on meeting our shadows. So uh, you can look at the East Point website. I think that, uh, yeah, Kate has put that in the chat and also encourage you to uh, take a look at the website for our collaborators for Beloved Community Well, which is the Necessary Trouble Collective to find other um, events that hopefully you will find meaningful. And I think that's all the announcements that I had to make. Let's see here. 
Yeah, and as a way of closing, I'm gonna put a, a little prompt in the chat for one more invitation for sharing. Um, did that get in there? Yeah, what's one or two gems you found during tonight's session? Could be an insight, a great question you're leaving with, a new friend, a feeling that you had during the experience. Go ahead and just throw some of those in the chat. We'll have a chatter fall of gems from tonight's session. And also want to let you know that after we close, we will actually keep the room open for about 10 minutes for anyone who wants to stay um, to continue a conversation that you felt like might have gotten cut off when the breakout rooms ended or for further connection in whatever way you'd like. And um, during that time, if it would be meaningful for you to have a breakout with someone that you wanted to connect with more, we're happy to do that. It's just sort of an informal 10 minutes for whatever uh, still needs to happen. So feel free to add your gems in the chat and or continuing uh, appreciations or gratitudes for Kazu as a way of closing out. Yeah, appreciating this mention of being with friends itself can be any of the above, coping, resilience, thriving, it's a strategy, loving the small group shares, heartfelt connection, what Luis's comment on resilience, the vulnerability shared, time to let the nervous system settle. Kazu's thought about self-care as delusion. And yeah, like the boy with the duck. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks again, everyone, for being with us. Again, we'll keep the room open for the next 10 or so minutes and inviting you to come off mute if say goodbye if you want and or continue to hang out. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks so much everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you Chris. Thank you Kazu. Thank you all.